We are in our second week of our Pray First uh, series. How many of y'all here last week for the first message? Anybody? A few of y'all? Okay. So uh, for y'all that don't know, we are in the middle. We're actually starting our second week of our 21 days of prayer here at Neon Life. And I want to tell you, um, it, it, this is, we do this two times a year. We do it in January to start off the year. In the, the beginning of the year, we do prayer and fasting, um, which is not my most exciting part because I love to eat. So uh, giving up the food is hard to do, uh, but it is completely worth it. And then we get to the midway part of the year. Uh, we get into like July or August and where we're at right now. And we just have prayer, 21 days of prayer. And some of us feast. I mean, it's, it's exciting. And so uh, I, wanna, I wanna say that um, we have seen so many great things happen through the 21 days of prayer that we have each year. And for many of us at Neon Life, it becomes really one of our favorite parts of the year. And it's just because we, we have this time as a church to really draw into God's presence, to really draw into that time to kind of give him the first part of our day. And I don't believe there's anything special about 21 days of prayer or the 21 days of the prayer that we're in. I just believe it's the fact that we as believers are getting together. And I've learned that in that moment, as we have that structure, uh, we tend to be more disciplined in giving God our time. And I think that's what makes... 21 days of prayer, so, uh, so amazing to participate in. And just so you know, if you don't know anything about it, uh, on uh, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., we meet at Mount Pleasant Community Center. And uh, uh, we open up with some worship, we have a devotion, and then we go into about 30, uh, 30 to, to about 30 to 45 minutes of prayer. Um, and then we come back together and pray as, as a team. Um, and then on Saturdays, all year round, uh, on a Saturday uh, at 10.30 a.m., uh, we meet here at the school. And the same thing, we have a devotion. We open up with a moment of worship and just time to pray. And I want to encourage you, if you can be a part of that, if you can be a part of 21 Days of Prayer, I know it's early, but if you can be a part, I want to encourage you to get there. There's something so powerful in being a part of that. If you can't, I want you to find time in your day to just give God some of your time. Uh, but year-round on Saturdays, if you can be a part of our Saturday prayer, um, I just want to encourage you to be part of that too. It's so amazing to see what happens when we give God our time and we take the time to, to just pray and communicate with him. And so it was just fitting that as we go into 21 days of prayer, we have a series on prayer. And I want to tell you, Pastor Eric did such a phenomenal job last week um, starting out this series. And uh, he talked about the Lord's Prayer and he really broke it down. And if you didn't get a chance to hear that, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to it. But what I want to do this morning is really just kind of piggyback on the message that he gave last week. And what I've noticed is that oftentimes um, as Christians, what we, we tend to do is uh, we, we get into this um, the, the cycle where we make prayer a little bit too complicated. I think we, we've made prayer way more complicated than it has to be. And so really, as you look at the life of Jesus, I feel like there's um, really four principles in his life that we can see take place, that if we do these things, it really makes our prayer life more simplistic, but it also makes it effective. And so what I wanna do is I, I want to take the next few minutes and I wanna go over these four things that really are, are very easy to understand and they're very easy to do. And I believe that if we do these four things, we can develop a more effective prayer life. And so I wanna jump straight into the points this morning. And the very first thing we have to do is we have to be simple. We just have to be simple in our prayer. And when I say that, I don't mean to have shallow prayers. Um, I don't mean that our prayer life should just be uh, we, we, we get up and we pray in the morning and then we pray over our food and we pray that our Big Mac becomes healthy. Um, I don't mean any of that. What I mean is that um, we really uh, just get to this place where our hearts are pointed towards God. That when we pray, we pray from the sincerity of our heart and that what we pray, we know that it matters, that the things that we're praying for actually matters. And so um, here's what I know is that some of you love to talk. I'm one of those people, I like to talk. But what I've seen take place is it's so easy. We come in and we can talk and talk and talk and talk. Anybody know people that talk a little too much? Um, yeah. <laughs> Be careful who raises your hand. <laughs> uh, some of you have to go home with these people, guys. <laughs> no, um, so we know people that love to talk and really it's so easy for some people to have communication. But yet we have such a hard time talking to God. And I believe that if we would approach God the same way, 
and be willing to have a conversation with God the same way we have conversation with people. This would be so much simpler to have a prayer life because all prayer is, honestly, is just communication and relationship with God. And so we have to be more simple in, in how we pray. Um, last week, uh, Pastor Eric went over this, but I, I wanna go back into these verses in Matthew chapter six, and it's verse seven through 13. It says, and when you pray, Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So I want to pause here. Um, So it's it's saying, you know, don't go babbling on and just repeating words and all these things like the pagans do. Um, It's not saying that you can't continue to pray for the same thing. In fact, Jesus in Scripture tells us to be persistent in praying for what we need. What it's saying is, is that you're not going to impress God by the continual repetitive speech, by the, these actions that are not truly from your heart, that you're just kind of wanting to impress God with your words. We don't have to use sophisticated words to get to God. And we don't have to use repetitive words and get into this crazy posture to, to, to get to the ears of God. Um, he wants our hearts and he wants us to speak um, according to the relationship that we have with him. And so if you continue on, you see that Jesus goes into what we call the Lord's Prayer. And it says, um, then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we see this structure of prayer and Jesus is not saying that we have to pray those exact words. It's really the heart behind the prayer, which I'll go into in a minute. But I wanna ask you this question. Um, have, have any of you um, ever been in a place where people are praying and as somebody begins to pray, it causes you to be insecure in your prayer? I know I've been to that place. It's like you, you go and they, they use these big words and they've got such this powerful prayer. They're thinking of things that you've never thought of. And, you know, uh, Pastor Eric talked about the popcorn prayer, like where you, you know, you squeeze the hand and the next person's turn. I, I've, even still this day, I find myself in those places where I hear somebody pray and I'm like, whew, that was powerful and I can't do anything like that. And, and we catch ourselves in this insecurity and um, what I'm glad is, is that God does not expect those sophisticated words to hear me. He wants me to speak how I speak. He wants me to talk to him on a relational level. And so while it's great that those people have sophisticated words, it's not the sophisticated words that get those people successful in their prayer life. In fact, we think about it, if I could say, hey, you got something really crazy going on in your life and you need a miracle, I think we all have that person we automatically think of. Like if I go to that person, yo, they got some powerful prayers and something's gonna happen. We all know that person. We call them prayer warriors in the church, right? They're not a prayer warrior because they have the big words, What makes them that prayer warrior is the fact that they have their hearts so tuned in to speaking with God and they have such a communication with God. Like they're genuine in what they're speaking. They're genuine in what they believe. Um, They know that when they go to God, they're having a conversation with the creator. That's what makes their prayer so powerful. And if you look in in James chapter one, it's not gonna be on the screen. I believe it's James chapter one. um, You see where it says that if you need wisdom for anything, go to God because he generously gives it to you but you have to have faith. And then it goes on to say, if you don't have faith when you're asking for those things, you're just like a wave being tossed in the wind. Now we've all seen um, a video or a picture of a storm in an ocean and you see the waves just going crazy. That's what your life becomes like if you don't have faith in what you're speaking. We, we, we've got to go to God uh, really with our hearts and with our desires and we have to have a conversation with him as God and as our father in order for us to get Um, get to where our prayers are effective. Three things we see um, in the Lord's Prayer. Um, And and like I said, if, if if you didn't hear the message last week, I want you to go back to that because Pastor Eric really breaks down each verse of this. But I really noticed three things that uh, happen within the Lord's Prayer. And the first thing that we see um, is it's just, God, let your needs and your desires be fulfilled above all else. Like God, let your desires, your needs, your kingdom, that's number one. The second thing we see take place is God give provision for all the needs I have today. So God, give me what I need today. 
help me get through my life, bless me. And then the third thing we see is, is just God protect me from the enemy and guide me in a life of righteousness. And here's what I believe, if we can get to those three things, if we can get to our hearts or after God's will and his desires and his needs, and then we allow him to come in and to give us our needs and our desires, and, and not all of our desires, but give us what we need, and then we go to the third thing where we say, okay, God, now I need you to guide me in my life. Protect me from the evil one. Protect me from temptation. God, guide me in the lifestyle that you want me to, to live in. Go before me in everything I do. Those three things cover the entire basis of our lives. And I believe that those things are very essential in our prayer lives, but also the life that we live. Now, if we're gonna take it further, uh, really the most essential thing that we need in our prayer life is we have to have the Holy Spirit. And that through the Holy Spirit, we see everything we do become successful. We see everything we do really fall into the purpose that God has for our lives. You know, each week, um, I always, always, in any message I ever speak, I always try to bring the Holy Spirit in and the impact that he makes in our lives. And the reason why is because I believe that so many of us try to operate without the Holy Spirit being present. And the Holy Spirit has to be present for us to operate according to the kingdom of God. In fact, we see that Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to get him through his life. The Holy Spirit is an essential part of our lives. And some of us get really uncomfortable with that. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to be a part of our lives. And what's cool is what we see happen when we allow the Holy Spirit to be present is we really see our prayer life take off. Well, here's why. If you look in Romans chapter 8, verse 26... It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do, not, we do not know how we should pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever got to a place where you don't know what to pray anymore? Like, you're at this place where your prayer is just stagnant, and it just seems empty. I'll tell you, for me, I'm ADD, like squirrel, all the time. And so I get to these moments where I go to pray and I'm like, I have every good intention to wake up and pray. And I'll get up and I'll just kind of lean up against the headrest or the, 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 the headboard and I'll start praying. Anybody ever fallen asleep when you pray? Y'all, it's bad. I saw in first service, I'll never forget this prayer and I, I, I don't remember exactly what I said. I try to forget it, but... I was praying so greatly with the Lord and I felt the spirit move so much that I began to pray for the Smurfs and the aliens and I'm praying for blue people and I'm going, wow, like this is a problem. Like, like I stopped myself, like wake up, you know. Um, just a complete side note that has nothing to do with my message um, other than the fact that my ADD just like now tends to kick in. And what I love about God is that he, um, he helps us get through those moments of prayer. That when we get to a place that either our ADD kicks in and we start praying for Smurfs or we get to this place that honestly we have no idea what to pray anymore. You're just like, God, I don't really feel like praying. Part of me wants to pray, but I really have not, like I'm, I'm just dead. I haven't had my coffee yet. I've got no idea what to pray. In those moments that we become stagnant, God is so amazing and gracious to bless us with his Holy Spirit to guide us into what to pray about. And really, when we begin to let the Holy Spirit guide our prayers, prayer becomes simple. Because as we let the Holy Spirit speak on our behalf, the Holy Spirit begins to show us the things to pray about. I'll tell you, there's been many a times that I know I need to pray. I don't know what to pray. And I say, God, I just need your Holy Spirit to show me who to pray for. Like, is there anybody right now that I need to pray for? And if a name comes to my mind, I don't care if I like them or not, I'm gonna pray for that person. God, bless that person's day. I don't know what's going on in their lives right now, but God, you put them on my heart and you know. So God, I want you to bless those people. God, can you begin to show me the things I have to be thankful for? Like you would think we would remember those things. But there's times we forget all the things that we can be thankful for. And so how I keep it simple is in those moments, if I just think of something I'm thankful for, I'll literally just take two seconds, like, God, I'm grateful for blank. 
Like, God, thank you for my job. God, thank you that I have a house. I remember one time I walked into my, my, my kitchen and almost like cried because I had a fork. And it was just the fact that God was showing me, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? It, it, it? What was crazy was what God was showing me is that I've provided for your every need. I look down, I'm like, God, I have silverware. There are people that haven't got silverware. Like, I'm thankful. It's so simple. Just having that conversation with God. Here's the, here's the second thing that we have to do is we have to be real. We need to learn to be real with God. So to preface this next verse of scripture, um, you, you see Jesus and he's, uh, he's at the Last Supper. And, and you look back over the years and he's, he's done his ministry with the 12 disciples and they've been alongside with him everywhere he's gone. And he's poured into them. He's taught them all of these things. Like these are his best friends. And so he, he's sitting there and he's at what's going to be the Last Supper with the disciples. And he begins to speak and, and, and bring up what's about to happen. He starts to talk about the fact that he's about to be betrayed by one of his friends, by one of the disciples. And I sit here and I imagine Jesus being at this place. And let's be honest, anybody in here love food? And okay, so the best conversations happen around a dinner table. And so when you get all your friends together, if like everybody's gonna hang out, what's the first thing? What are we gonna eat? Like there, there's never an event without food. We love food. And so some of the best conversations happen around a table. And so Jesus is sitting here, he's having this kind of this, this final dinner conversation with his disciples. He brings up that he's about to be betrayed. He brings up what's about to take place. And I kind of imagine what the emotions that Jesus was feeling in this moment were. Because he is not excited for what's to come. I imagine him also sitting there and he knows that, that Judas is about to betray him. And he has to sit here with this man knowing what's about to take place. And so you, you, you get through the, the Last Supper and we get to, to Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 44. And it says, Then Jesus went out and made his way, as he customarily did, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He went away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like the drops of blood falling to the ground. I think at this moment, we see Jesus at one of his most vulnerable points. And what we have to remember is that while Jesus was fully God, he was also fully human. And so he faced the emotions that we face on a daily basis. And so what we see take place is Jesus gets to this point. He knows what's about to come. He knows what's about to happen. And you can tell that Jesus is not excited about it. He's actually so honest. He says, God, I really want you to take this away from me. But what I find amazing about the story and what Jesus does is as he's wanting this to be taken away, he also knows that God's will and God's desire comes above his own. So he says, God, if it's not your will, Father, if it's not your will, I'm going to do it. Like, if it's your will for me to go through this, I'm going to go through it. But the part I want you to really hear in this, and, and we see this principle that, that, that Jesus allows us to be real with the Father, is we only have just this small part of the conversation that Jesus had with God that night. When you get to the end of it, you see that it says there was anguish. He, he was dealing with anguish and he prayed more earnestly. It said his sweat was so thick, he was so nervous that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I kind of wonder what was the conversation like with Jesus and the Father that night? But what we can see is that Jesus is being real with the Father. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying like, yo, be real with him, go cuss him out. That's not what I mean. But what I'm saying is, is you can be real with how you feel with God. You can tell him what you're going through. You can tell him how you feel about the situation. If you dislike somebody, you can tell God you dislike him. If you feel hatred for somebody, tell God you feel hatred for him. Let God be in the most vulnerable and inner parts of your life. And just be real with him. And I think so many times we wait for us ourselves to get to this place where we're like in this good posture and we're ready and we go up to God. Okay, God, I can come to you now because I feel great. 
Jesus didn't wait till he felt great to go to God. He went to the Father at his lowest moment. And he said, God, I don't want to do this. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anguish from this, Father. I need you to be in my life. We got to go to God at our lowest moment. We can't clean ourselves up before we go to God because God is who cleans us up. And so what I want to challenge you to do is just be real with God. Like, he already knows your every thought. He knows how you feel. It says he knows how many hairs are on your head. That's crazy. He knows your every thought. But he wants you to go to him with those needs. So while God already knows what's taking place in your life, he knows how you feel, he, he, he knows your thought about it, he wants you to go to him because he wants a relationship with you. He loves to hear our voice. He loves it when we walk into his presence and tell him where we need him. And so we've got to learn to just be real with God. And for some of us, this is easy. I mean, if you've ever driven through fresh hour traffic in the Metroplex, it's easy to tell God how you feel. It's crazy. But I feel like a lot, a lot of times we, we kind of hold ourselves back because we don't know fully how to be honest with God. And I want to tell you, it's okay to be real with him. It's okay to tell him the emotions you have. If you don't believe me, I want to encourage you, go back and read some Psalms that David wrote. Like David was pretty honest with God about how he felt. There's times he's like, God, like, where were you? Why'd you abandon me at this moment? Like you left me, like what's happening? And God always brings correction. I'll tell you, if you're gonna be real, real with God, expect correction. But he corrects you because he loves you. And those corrections draw you closer to him. We have to learn to, to be real with him. If you look in uh, Psalm chapter 55, verse 22, um, it says, throw your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the, God, the godly to be appended. Listen, God expects us to go to him with our burdens. God is there waiting to get us through those hardest parts of our lives. He's there to get us through the emotions that we feel. He's there to show us the truth in every situation. And what I like, I was thinking about this, is that when you're burdened, in those moments that you're burdened, some of the most genuine and true emotions arise. Because when you get to that moment that you're worn out and you're vulnerable, you can't help but be honest. And you can't be burdened and feel uplifted at the same time. Unless you bring God in the picture. And when you go to God with your burdens, he in turn will uplift you. And he'll show you the truth. And he'll show you the, really the positive in the situations that you're going through. So I think the first two, be simple. Um, be real. I think that those we can kind of grasp, we, 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 we can do okay with. But I think these next two, um, practically speaking, tend to be the hardest two to follow. So you, you be simple, you, you be real, but the third thing you have to do is you have to isolate yourself. Now, um, here in the last few years, isolation has kind of become a negative term um, because we were forced to isolate. I don't mean isolate yourself permanently. I don't mean like this long-term isolation where you don't have friendships and you don't have people around you because God actually wants you to have healthy relationships. Like he, you're, he, he's all about relationships, okay? What I mean is that we have to learn to pull away from the rest of the world and society long enough in our day to give God time. We've got to learn to get to this place where it's just me and you, God, and nobody else. And when you pull into those moments, I'll tell you, it's crazy what takes place. So another thing we see in Jesus' life, um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 6, it says that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, you have received, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I like when you read scripture, one thing you notice is that there's multiple times that Jesus pulls away from the disciples and he pulls away from the crowds 
And he goes to this place by himself to have a conversation with the Father. To give you some examples, you look in Luke chapter 5, you can look in Luke chapter 6. And right there, you see two examples where Jesus would go on the mountain by himself just to spend time with the Father. Now, for y'all that are married, the greatest conversations you have with your spouse are when it's just you and your spouse. When there's no kids there to distract you. I'll tell you, me and Steph are at that place. Caden is about to be three. Homeboy can talk. (laughs) And it never makes sense. And it's this. It's just, it can be quiet. And me and Steph go to talk. And it's just, dada, 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 dada. And you're like, what? And he's like, hi. I'm like, bro. Like, you know? What do you do, you know? So some of you, like, you're, you, you, the moms are just like, isolation? What's isolation? I can't even go to the bathroom in private. Like, can't even take a shower. I get it. Like, I, kind of. Caden busts through the door. Yeah. Isolation. So I understand it's hard to find isolation sometimes. Here's what's all first service. What about after you put the kids to sleep? Because what I find really interesting is why can you not find 15, 20, 30 minutes after you put the kids to sleep to spend time with God? Well, that's my me time and I just don't have time and I'm tired. Interesting. Because after you put the kids to sleep, it doesn't take you very long to grab the remote and turn on Netflix or Hulu It doesn't take very long to take your your phone out and scroll aimlessly through Facebook and aimlessly through Instagram or whatever you scroll through on your phone. It's amazing we make time to do those things. But then we say we don't have enough time to give God 30 minutes of our life each day. And how many times, like statistically, I read a stat because I'm I'm, I'm back in school and so I came across the statistic that on average, If somebody is doing work or they are studying or whatever it is, if they pull out their phone to look at anything, average is 23 minutes of distraction before they put their phone back down. 23 minutes is the average that once you pull your phone out, you're on your phone for 23 minutes aimlessly scrolling. And what I find interesting is do we really care what's on Facebook? Because I'm gonna be honest, when Susie gets a new dog, I don't care. Great, it's a cute little puppy, I want one. But I don't care. I care in the moment. But I have a feeling that when it comes time for me to get up to be face to face with God, and I'm either facing heaven or hell, I'm pretty sure I ain't gonna be like, bro, Susie got a new puppy in 2023. I'm not gonna care about that. I'm gonna be caring about like eternity with Jesus. It don't matter. The the puppy don't matter. And uh, uh, here's what I'm saying. Our priorities are not straight. We say that we can't find time to isolate and spend time with Jesus. But we can find time to scroll on our phone. And we can find time to watch a show we probably shouldn't be watching. 30 minutes. Every day just isolate and give that time to Jesus. And I'll tell you that um, 30 minutes in the presence of God feels way better than 30 minutes of anything else you can do in your life. And we've got to get to that place where we just spend that, and it didn't have to be 30 minutes. I say 30 minutes, my point is, it's just time with God. Like just give God your time and your heart and your desires and isolate and get to that place where you're spending time with him. And when you have those intentional moments with him, your life changes. I've shared this story before, uh, but about, um, I guess it would have been three and a half years ago, it was before Caden was born, um, and the house that we had currently lived in, it was a two-bedroom house. And so um, obviously you had our bedroom. And then right across the hall, as it was, um, there was another bedroom. And I just kind of made it my make-do office. And so I remember um, we had this, one of those really old couches that have the bed in it. And it's got like the really coarse fabric with all the, like the floral design you know what I'm talking about I think it was red I'm colorblind I don't know y'all but it was some color dark and um the most uncomfortable couch I've ever sat on in fact it was like a hand-me-down I was like the third or fourth hand-me-down it was Colton's and he's like I don't want it anymore I'm like well bro I need a couch for my office so I take it and I'm sitting on this couch one night and I um I had told Steph I'm gonna go pray 
And I said, I just need to spend time in the presence of God. So I'm going to lock the door. I have no idea when I'll be out. Just I'm going with it. So I walk in and um, I sit on this very uncomfortable couch. And I have my little JBL speaker. And I turn it on. And any of y'all ever heard Nothing Else by Cody Carnes? Yo, that song, Straight to the Heart. I'm going to tell y'all, Cody Carnes, man, he's... He's, that's my boy. So um, I'm sitting there and, and, and I'm praying and the song, Nothing Else Comes On. And I just began to look back over my life and, and how my relationship with God was the time I'd been given him. And honestly, it was slim to none, it, it felt like which really wasn't even true. It was just that all my time that I was giving him was ministry related, which can be a problem. Um, when, when your whole life becomes about the ministry that you're doing and not about your relationship with Jesus, it becomes a problem. And so I sat there and the song comes on and I'm, I'm just, I'm closing my eyes, God. I'm like, God, yes, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry for all of these things I've done. I'm sorry that when I've put my ministry over my relationship with you, which doesn't seem possible, but it is. I'm sorry that I haven't been giving you the time I need. And I remember I get to this place, like, God, I just want to be in your presence. Like, I'm, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Like, that's part of the song, right? And so as I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I just envision myself, and like this, this spotlight comes on, and it goes onto these feet. And so far you're like, look, this sounds more like a nightmare than a dream because feet are disgusting. It was the best feet I've ever seen in my life, and it was, it was Jesus' feet. And I'm, I'm down at his feet, and I'm just going, Jesus, I just want to be in your presence. And I'm not really like a, I don't feel like I'm a very emotional person most of the time. And I, I hit this moment and I'm just like, I'm ugly crying, y'all. Like mascara running that I'm not even wearing. I wasn't even wearing mascara and it was still going down my face. And I'm like ugly crying. And I'm just like, God, I'm, I just want to be in your presence. And I've never figured out how to explain this because I don't really know how to. It's one of those things you just have to experience. But all of a sudden it was like Jesus had just embraced me. Y'all, I'm not a hugger. I'm getting there. Thanks to my boy Robbie over here. I'm getting there. Um, but I've never really been a hugger. But it was like the best hug I've ever got in my life. Y'all, I was ready to go to heaven. I'm like, yo, I'm going to heaven now. Like we're, we're here. Um, but it was just because I was in the presence of God. That was almost four years ago. And that was still one of the most impactful times I've ever had in my life. And I think something I share with my teens all the time, and I've shared it very heavily the last few weeks as we've gotten back from this conference. A lot of amazing things happened at the conference. The presence of God was definitely at the conference. But I realized that we get caught up in the emotion of those things. And the presence of God is not just at a conference. It's not just in the four walls of Neon Life Church when you come in on a Sunday morning with a phenomenal worship team and you're worshiping your heart out. In fact, I've had a greater moment, that moment on my uncomfortable couch that had a hole bitten into the cushion was a greater moment to me than any conference I've ever been to. Because I was one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and I knew that I was in his presence. And I knew that I was coming out of that differently than I walked in. And when we could get to that place where we pull away to have that moment, I'm gonna tell you, it'll shake your world. It is amazing what takes place in those small moments that we isolate. Can you find that time? Can you find the time to spend a little bit of your moment with God? You know, a lot of us talk about getting up in the morning and praying in the morning. And yes, I encourage, like, get up in the morning and pray. If nothing else, at least say, God, God, my feet is like, get up. But if at 5.30 you're like me and you start praying for aliens that we don't even know exist, because you're falling asleep, then find another time in your day to pray. Just find the time to get away 
long enough to spend time with God. Here's the last thing we have to do, and this is probably the hardest one, is that we have to be consistent. We have to be consistent in our prayer life. Um, so what does that mean? Um, a minute ago, I read out of Luke chapter 22. And I want to read that first verse again, uh, verse 39. It says, then Jesus went out and made his way as he customarily did. I just want to stop there. That's it. It says that he went and he made his way like he customarily did. Guess what that means? That it was a custom in his life for him to walk away, to isolate and find time in the presence of God. It wasn't just an, you know, an, 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 an exceptional time. It was like he did this by custom. It was second nature for Jesus to get away and to go into the presence of God. In fact, the greatest decisions, I mean, Jesus always made great decisions, but when Jesus had to make a really big decision, you see him go pray before he did it. Did y'all know that Jesus spent a whole night praying before he chose his disciples? He walked away in private to pray for the Lord's will to be done in his life. We have to make it a custom. We have to be consistent in our prayer life. We've got to make it an everyday thing. You know, I, I shared earlier that for some of us, when we begin to talk about um, uh, 21 days of prayer, when people hear that it's going to be 45 minutes of praying, people are like, yeah, I'm not about that, dog. So they don't come. Because for some people, 45 minutes seems like a long time. Does 45 minutes of praying seem long to anybody? Like, it's a long time for some of us. But what I've found is that maybe you just start at five. Maybe you just walk into the presence of God for five minutes. Next thing you know, five minutes ain't enough, so you go to 10. <laughs> then you go to 15. And then you get to 21 days of prayer and you're like, bro, 45 minutes was not long enough. It's already over. Be consistent in your prayer life. You know, at the very beginning, I said, be simple. I don't believe there's a designated posture to go to God. What do I mean? Scripture never says that you have to fall face down on the floor and have your nose buried in the ground to get to God. It never says that you have to go to this specific spot at the edge of your bed in this perfect straight posture praying to God for him to hear you. He just wants you to have a conversation. What becomes consistent in your prayer life? Here's what I've learned. 5.30 in the morning does not work for me. There's three things I've learned in my prayer life. Don't pray on a bed, don't pray on a couch, and don't pray in a comfortable seat. Just don't. For me. Because every time, I'll either doze off, I'll fall asleep, start praying for things that don't exist, or I'll start thinking about dinner because I love food. <laughs> and my prayer just, just disappears. I've tried praying while I'm driving to work. And I want to tell you all, consistency, like find those in-between moments. So if I go to like a long prayer on my drive to work, it don't work. Because then I start thinking about traffic or I'm hungry in the morning and I start thinking about what I want for breakfast or whatever it is, like I, I get distracted. What's gonna work? So for me, um, I had to tell Steph recently that um, she became a barrier in my prayer life, not by anything she's done. Uh, so hear me carefully. Um, she's, she is amazing at praying. She's very supportive in it. Um, but what I, I figured out is that um, I would have a hard time getting into this place of prayer because I didn't want her hearing me pray which is dumb. In fact, I think your spouse should hear you pray. Your kids should hear you pray. There's nothing like a praying father for a kid or a praying husband or a praying wife or a praying mom. We gotta get to that place that we're willing to pray and find that consistency. But for me, what I've realized is I can't do the couch, I can't do the bed, I can't do a really comfortable seat. You can ask Steph, sometimes she'll know when I'm praying because this is what I started doing. I'll be in my house just going, all right, God. And I'm just making circles. 
stepping over stuff that all the toys that Caden has in the, in the floor. And, but if I'm walking around, I stay focused in my prayer. Now, maybe for you, you don't have to walk around. My point is, find that thing in your life. Find what's gonna work for you. And it might start out at five minutes. Listen, there's not a magic number to spending a whole entire hour or two hours in prayer. It's about the heart and it's about your intentions as you go to God. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray constantly. Longest verse in all of scripture. Just constantly pray. Scripture doesn't mean that we can't do anything in our lives but pray. I believe what scripture is saying is we have to find consistency in our prayer. That we have to make it a daily thing to pray. That it's second nature. That in those in-between moments, that as we feel something, we go to him with that thing. And we converse with him and we have a relationship with him. Y'all, there's nothing more powerful than having a conversation with God. So, be simple. Be real, isolate yourself, and be consistent. If we could do those four things, I believe our prayer life will become more effective and that we'll see a difference in how our relationship with God is. Listen, prayer was never meant to be complicated. It was just meant to be communication with our Heavenly Father. And all of us are capable of doing that. If I get everybody to stand up, I'm going to go ahead and ask the prayer team to step forward. Let's get you to, I want you to bow your heads for just a minute. I want you to take a moment and just evaluate your relationship with the Lord. Some of you might have a relationship with him, but maybe it's drifted a little bit. You haven't been given your relationship with him the time it needs. Or maybe you've actually never even started a relationship with Jesus. I want all of us to have the opportunity to start that relationship with him. So if you're in here and you haven't given your life to Christ, you haven't started that relationship, but right now you say, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Can you just raise your hand? My second question is if maybe you've already given your life to him and you have a relationship with him, but maybe it's become stagnant and you're just ready to kind of recommit, you're ready to revamp that relationship with him. Can you raise your hand for that? If you're trying, you can put it back down. I want to I wanna take this time and I just want to pray with you. God, I thank you for everybody that's giving their life to you. That's giving their life back to you, Father. God, each of us hit this place where we might become stagnant. We each hit this place where maybe we feel distant. So God, I pray that you'll just renew our relationships with you. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross so that we could have eternity with you, so that we could be forgiven for our sins, God. So I pray that you'll renew us today and lead us in this relationship with you. In your holy name, amen. So here in a minute, we're going to go back into worship. And as we go into worship, we have a prayer team up here. If you have anything you want to pray about, if you need healing, if you... If you're, if you're dealing with stuff mentally, if there's something going on in your family, whatever it is, as we go back into this worship, I want us to do one of two things. I want us to do one of two things. If, if, if you don't need to pray, can you just stay still for a minute and get into a, a final moment of worship? But if you need prayer for anything, I want to encourage you to step forward and find prayer. So let's take this time to pray and to worship together. God, we just thank you again for what you're doing. We thank you for what you continue to do. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, God. 
Father, in this moment, I pray that we will seek and experience your presence, God. I pray that we'll see breakthroughs in these final moments of service, God. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love for us and your grace. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. Let's pray and worship together.